Welcome back, everyone. This is episode 153 of the Jiu-Jitsu Dummies podcast. We are brought to you by Black Belt Digital Marketing. <coughs> Excuse me. Anything you need to build your business on or offline. It's website design, Google Ads, graphic design. Any type of local marketing is where we specialize, but printing, we do it all. Uh, check us out at Black Belt Digital Marketing on Instagram or our website, bbdigitalmarketing.com. You can request a free review of your online presence today. My name is Milton Campus. I'm a Black Belt training out of South Florida. We got Christian behind the camera. Now, Christian, be a little more excited today because you know the guest. So I'm going to do it again. <laughs> we got Christian behind the camera. What up? Hey. <laughs> there you go. Don't forget to like, comment, download, share. Click that subscribe button. We really appreciate the support. Uh, joining us today is Black Belt, uh, owner of Enclave Jiu-Jitsu out in Cleveland, Ohio. It is, right? And yes. uh, co-author of Worth Defending. We have Scott Burr that's going to join us in a couple minutes. I'm going to do a couple of quick shout outs as always. Uh, we are also brought to you by Academy Safe. I got my Academy Safe. Uh, so I got my gear, Christian. I got my shirt. Got a sticker. Right. We're moving along. Uh, Academy Safe is a nonprofit whose mission is to help clean up the martial arts by advocating for background checks, U.S. Center for Safe Sports certifications, and concussion training for all coaches, staff members, uh, basically anybody that works in the academy throughout the United States and Canada. I'm the founder and executive director. Rob Ingram, the founder of McDojo, is our executive VP. We've got a Secret Service agent on the board, right? I mean, we're kind of really cool and put together. We launched the website Friday, uh, Monday. Today is November 8th. We launched this past Monday. There was a problem with NBC Universal Sports Engine. Yes, NBC Universal bought a background check company that provides this whole back end service. There was a bug. And none of our subscriptions <laughs> could get purchased. They're working on it. We basically like had to like tear it down and then like rebuild it. It's a quick process, but as of today, Friday, we, we can't take any new memberships. Uh, so hopefully by next week, we're going to be up and running again. Uh, so you know, with a nonprofit that got started in July to be up this quickly was a, a feat. But um, we should have everything up next week. I, I'm hoping so. I'm communicating with them every day. Uh, but uh, if you want to check it out, it's academysafe.org. You can donate there on the homepage. And hopefully by the time this comes out, you can click the little NBC Sports Engine button and go right to the site and log in, become a member of Academy Safe. And basically, we're asking you to do background checks, safe sports certification, concussion training. We want to make sure you have your CPR, first aid, defibrillator training. We'll help you get a defibrillator. Uh, you've got to pay or lease a defibrillator. We'll put you together with a company uh, named Divide that we're working with. Um, what else? Uh, business, make sure you have your business insurance. A lot of people don't realize like academies are notorious for letting their policies lapse. So we want to make sure that the, the academy is insured. Uh, we want to make sure that you have security cameras inside of your facility. So basic things that most academies should be doing. You don't have to do every one of these to be on the site or to be listed. The main things we want to make sure you got your background checks and your safe sports certification. That's the most important two things. We want to keep kids safe with all the sexual assault happening in martial arts. We want to make sure these kids and, and you know our families are safe. Um, you've got to be over 18. So any of your employees, so your younger coaches don't have to do this, but 18 years and older, you can get a background check so you can be a member of the site. So I'm going to leave that there again, academysafe.org. Check it out. Give us your feedback. Uh, we'd love you guys to be members. Uh, thank you to our friends over at Flow and Roll. Hands down the best custom gi and no gi gear in the business. You can visit them on Instagram at flow underscore n underscore roll. Check out their custom designs that they create for academies and competitors all across the country. They're actually like on like like at all the IBJJ, uh, uh, IBJJF events, uh, like every weekend throughout the U.S. this year. Uh, they're actually going to be in Florida this weekend. This will this will come out after, but he's doing the AD, AD, ADCC events now as well. Um, they have an incredible pre-order program. And like if you need to stock up for your academy, he'll basically put your stuff for sale on his website so that you can get the money to get all your stuff. Like it's a little, just a couple hundred bucks down and then, you're getting everything that you need. You use the money or the profits from what you sell online to stock up your gear in the academy. So it's great for a new owner or somebody who's just having trouble like getting, you know, getting gear or hold, having gear in stock in the academy. So uh, Sean's great to work with. You can email him at flowenroll at gmail.com or just visit the website flowenroll.com. And uh, you can fill out. There's a form that pops up as soon as you go to the site. You can fill it out and you can get more information. Um 20% off with code JJD on any of your just regular online orders. So you want to get a gi, you want to get a rash guard set, um, belts. He does embroidery on belts. So you get 20% off your order. All right. He's awesome. 
Uh, Leo Optics. Always got to put the glasses on. I got my. I got the brown ones today. I wish I. I should know the names, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Leo Optics. I don't know all the names of the glasses, but these are the brown ones. These are brown, like straight up bamboo. You can even like it's just it's wood. All right, we've got the. Uh, let's go to the other side. Right, we've got the little red, little red stripe for black belts. You can request your your belt rank at checkout. But uh, shout out to Leo Optics, the go-to brand for sunglasses and apparel featuring their unique bamboo sunglasses. Uh, born in Southern California, their products embody the BJJ lifestyle that we all know and love. Visit leooptics.com and use code JJD for 10% off your order. And, uh, oh, let me go back. You know, what? one thing I didn't do was uh, for Academy Safe, we set up a coupon code. So if you register on Academy Safe, you can use... Uh, code JJD5, spell out five, JJD, F-I-V-E. The only reason I threw in the five, because it's 5% off, but also we couldn't, the system won't let you do a three digit or a three letter code. So we do JJD for everything. This is JJD5. Just spell it out and you get 5% off your uh, your membership there as well. All right, let's do this. Let's bring in Scott. Hey, man. What's up, man? Thank you for being so patient, man. I appreciate you. Thank you for coming oh, on. Welcome. Thank you for having me, man. Appreciate yeah, man. Um, so let's tell everybody, well, first of all, I, I've mentioned this on, on several podcasts. The first book that I've read cover to cover since high school, I don't even think I read any <laughs> books cover to cover in high school. I, You know, you go through, you skim it. I read this book every night before I, like, before Richard came on the first podcast. I read this thing. I lay in bed read for about a half hour, go to sleep a little bit every night. Got so into it, then be sometimes like I just couldn't put it down. I loved it. It was great. Congratulations on an awesome book. I know you got awesome feedback on Amazon, incredible reviews. And you know our in-house, I think he's a martial artist. I'm not really sure. I've stop, never seen a stop, picture. Stop it, uh, but Christian, he, he said, you know, he's one of these, he says he trains, but you never see him train, you know. Um, Christian, our producer, actually met you and he was the producer on the audiobook that you read, right? Absolutely instrumental in, in helping yes. us put out a, a decent audiobook. Yeah, Did he roll with you when he was out there? Because, I again, I don't know. He <laughs> says he, he says he knows jiu-jitsu. <laughs> you know what? No, he kept threatening to. Yeah. <laughs> Say it to me. Like, I did yeah. the same thing with him. I was yeah. like, dude, we should roll. No, yeah, he never did. Gonna come trade. Yeah, he's, yeah. One of the, he's one of those guys. But, he, yeah. you know, he's, he, he looks like he might be scary. He might be. I think he's got some hands. I don't know about jiu-jitsu yet. No, I was, I was like, oh, thank God he never showed up. Yeah. <laughs> well, again, small freaking world. Um, yeah, I was like, it's just kind of like, you know, I don't know. It's just nice to, you know, it's, I mean, it, I feel like in jujitsu, it's not six degrees of separation. It's like three degrees of separation. Like if somebody knows, everybody knows everybody. Yeah. Um, incredible book. Definitely suggest, you. Uh, you. you know, everyone going out and getting it. I started to see you post about Richard Bressel. Uh, mm -hmm. I understand he's very sick. Uh, we've talked about him on a couple of the last episodes. We put the GoFundMe uh, in the description on both the podcast. If you're listening to just the sound, you can go into the description and find the the uh, the GoFundMe, and then on YouTube as well, where we put out the full video and and the audio now because Apple or Google Podcast is now on only on YouTube. So we put it's everywhere. If you're what you're listening to us, just go to the description. But um, fill us in. Tell us if tell us as much as you can, as much as you guys are comfortable, uh, you know, talking about. Um, you know, how's Richard doing right now and, and what's going on and, and how can we help? Well, right now, Richard is, um, he's very, very sick. And basically what happened was he, he ended up, um, with a systemic infection, um, uh, I, I'm, I don't know. I'm getting, I'm not a doctor. Story. Like you got to say, Hey, I'm not yeah, a doctor. Right. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> Um, but he, you know, he ended up in the ICU because he was, he was very ill. And what they discovered is that he has, um, stage three cirrhosis of the liver, which is the point at which your liver can no longer, you know, your, your liver is an incredibly resilient organ and can heal. Uh, but once you've reached this point, it can no longer recuperate. And at this point, the the doctors still have no idea what caused this because usually anybody, any of your listeners who know what cirrhosis of the liver is, often this is associated with, with lifestyle issues, either, you know, poor diet, fatty liver disease, or alcohol abuse. And if you've read the book, you know that Richard is profoundly committed to his 
is incredibly clean. His lifestyle is incredibly clean and has been for 40. Um, so this is, this is not, and, and it's not related to, to any sort of other infection that it, or illness that attacks the liver. Um, the, the, the doctors literally can't figure out why this happened. But at this point, he is just, he's, he's dealing with the situation and it's the kind of situation where he's going to be, you know, be, be needing a, a liver transplant. Um, so he is, I, 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 I'm, I'm, there was a period there where people were aware that Richard went into the hospital and, um, but he was still communicating with people on Facebook and he was still responding to people with his phone. And when the GoFundMe got set up, the language around it was, oh, we're going to help Richard, you know, live a healthy life and all these things. And I, and I, I um, um, one of the reasons I wanted to come on your podcast was there's a, there's an, uh, an, an urgency here and an extremity of the situation that I, I just want to make sure people understand. Richard is really very ill and he, he needs, he's going to need some pretty profound medical intervention. And as we all know, in this uh, country um, that carries a very heavy financial burden. Um, and, you know, Richard is, he's a working jujitsu instructor like many of us. And so, you know, in, in his present health condition, I mean, the, the book is, is doing well, the support for the book has been incredible, but in, you know, in his current health condition, he can't uh, teach, can't work. Um, and and the, the treatments that are, you know, originally there was a conversation about taking him to Houston to be treated by this specialist who had had success dealing, treating uh, stage three cirrhosis or cirrhosis. Um, <clears throat> that at this point is kind of out of the question because of how, how sick Richard is right now. So he's being treated in LA and uh, he just really, really needs our, our support. And, and a, a lot of that can come down to, financial support yeah you know okay um in this situation so he's he's quite ill and he is in he, he, he we need we need to have his back at this point basically yeah man so for those who don't know who richard is do you want to go into a little bit just kind of give him the background of who he is and and maybe even talk about how you met and 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 how you got involved with the book absolutely so richard um uh, richard is the short story is Richard was Horian's first student in, in LA. He was his first regular student. And um, the, I think Horian had had people come through who he had taught it, it, before he met Richard. He was already sort of teaching lessons out of his garage. But Richard was kind of the first guy who became a regular student and continued on uh, to, you know, to today, training and teaching jujitsu. Um, but basically... <clears throat> Um, Richard, Richard met Horian in 1979, and very quickly thereafter, um, they became roommates. They both needed to, Richard needed to move out of the place he was in, Horian needed to move into a new place. And so they found a place together, and their, uh, the place they rented in Hermosa Beach became the Gracie Garage, that first Gracie Garage that most people think of when they think of, you know, the Gracie Garages. That was the real starting point. So. That's where you see, if you've seen on YouTube, that video of Richard training with Hickson with, and, and Elio is in the background and they're in that garage space with the very grainy footage. Um, that's where that took place. A lot of those images you, you see if you Google Gracie Garage or that you know, get shared when, when people write articles about the Gracie Garages, that's that house in Hermosa Beach. And actually, um, the last time I was out in LA, I was telling somebody who was, who was out there with me, I was like, you got to go look at this house. You just got to go see it and, you know, to make a little pilgrimage out to that place. And they went and it had been torn down. Oh, that house is now man. gone. Um, because that whole area is, is being, you know, people are buying these tiny places for a couple million bucks, tearing them down and then building $7 million places in their place. So unfortunately, that first Gracie garage is now gone. But the, the, the long and the short of it is that for basically the next almost 20 years, Richard was Horian's right-hand man. He was out, you know, he was doing demonstrations with Horian. He was trying to set up classes. He was setting up challenge fights. He was, he was basically telling any and everybody, like many of the early guys, he was a, he was an e evangelical about jujitsu. And, um, when Horian, uh, 
decided that it was time to, to needed to start the academy. They had been, you know, uh, the, the other Hoist was was here, Hickson was here, uh, Hegan Machado was here. Guys were coming in and teaching more and more classes out of more and more garages, and it reached the point where they were going to start an academy. Um, Horian couldn't get anybody to back him financially, and so he came to Richard, and Richard basically. Uh, there was the deal with the bank was that if they provided half of the money, then the bank would loan them the other half to start the academy. And so Richard and his uh, Richard himself, and then he got his parents to chip in the, the rest of the half that he didn't have. Basically, put that money in to start the academy. So R Richard is is literally the reason that the academy was able to open. Um, and then. He was an instructor at the academy. He was many people's first instructor at the, the original Gracie Academy. Um, he was one of the first certified instructors. I mean, he was in that very early group of people. Um, and ba you know, basically his, uh, and then he was, uh, um, when Horian and Art Davey had this idea about starting the UFC, and they went to the, to the students for investors, Hori, uh, Richard was one of the first people to throw money in to, to invest in the UFC, help that get started. He was there at all the early UFCs that the Gracies were were part of. Um, he's just been there at every step of the way, and was this sort of in the background figure who was the you know the spotlight was always on Horian or Hoyce or Hicks, and but he was back there doing a lot of the the groundwork stuff that was helping support all of these efforts. And so there's just there's this way that we, the the phrase I always use is that Richard really helped build the foundation of this house that we all now get to run around in and enjoy. So this world that we all we all live in, this jujitsu world, it was built on this foundation that Richard was instrumental in building. Um, and because he's such a, a humble guy and because he's still so, <clears throat> excuse me, he's so um, grateful to and all, you know, still you know, reverent to, to Horian and Hoist and all these guys that we all look up to and admire. You know, he's a guy who he's like, well, this story isn't really about me. And I go, man, you don't realize like this story, your story is so important and people don't, don't realize like he doesn't even sometimes to realize like what a big deal he is. Um, because he's just a very humble, um, he's not, not a self aggrandizing guy in any way. And so. Um, if you, you ask about like the process of working on this book, one of the things about the working on this book with him was was sort of almost pulling these stories out of him and the, getting him to acknowledge this, this the impact that he'd had. Um, so, so it feels yeah, like he it, wanted to be like the fly on the wall, but he was more than a fly on the wall. He was there. He was helping. He was loaning money. He was. I mean, like you said, he it was very instrumental yeah. in all of this. Absolutely, but he's yeah. not looking. He he was never looking for a lot of accolades. He wasn't. Uh, no, no, no. He, I mean, just yeah, very incredibly down to earth, humble guy. Um, really special person. Really special person. Yeah, love having him on, man. I you know, um, I hope to have him on again one day. You know, if you're listening yeah. to this, Richard, we hope you get better soon, and uh, you know, hopefully we get to see you on this screen again one day. Yeah. So, so the book has had, uh, you know, pretty good success. You've moved to, uh, you did the audio book again with our producer Christian here. Right. Um, what, what else have you written to, you know, talk about let's, let's hear, I know that you have written other books. I mean, you are a writer, correct? Yes. Right. Um, yeah. what else what might we have uh, seen from you or what else have you put out there? Well, so, um, actually in the midst of, of working on Richard's book, um, I was put in touch with um, Robert Drysdale, okay. who was at that time putting together the first draft of Opening Closed Guard. And so I ended up coming on and, and being serving as the sort of the editor and the designer and, and uh, sort of a, a collection of roles on that book and helping him publish that. And then from there, it's it's been a, a series of, of collaborations with other people. It's done a similar process to Richard. I've worked with uh, a woman named Kip Azoni Doyle on a book about the patent system, which was fascinating and I knew nothing about. I worked uh, with, with a guy named John Petrelli, who's a, a trainer out in Hollywood, kind of trainer to the stars, um, on his memoir about his sort of life's journey um, and the lessons he's learned along the way. Really fascinating story. Um, and then 
um, currently starting, <laughs> starting now almost two and a half years ago, I've been working with uh, Chris Howder on a, mm-hmm. on a book about his, you know, his life and his, it's, kind of, it's similar to, to Richard's book in certain, in certain ways. Uh, but um, if you know Chris, you know Chris is a, a very unique mind and so took <laughs> yeah. a, a, a little bit of a different approach with that book to, to try to do something that's this sort of reflective of his, um, his, his being. His 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 character, um, but you know, prior to that, I had been. I, I went to college for for writing. I was a, a creative writing major, and I was um, trying to write fiction for for a very long time. So from about two thousand and uh, uh, let's say two thousand and one um, till twenty nineteen, when I met Richard, I was very focused on writing. You know, long sort of long form fiction. So wrote a number of novels that nobody really wanted to read and then mm-hmm. put, a, uh, put out a few of them or put out one of them uh, and put out some other writing about training and jujitsu um, through, you know, it had, a, had, a, had a blog that I collected that was about training and mindset and stuff like that. So it's written a variety of, of, of sort of genres and, and uh, subjects over the years, but the last few years have been a lot of collaborations and a number of collaborations on uh, jujitsu and martial arts related. I'm also working on a book with a, a friend of mine named Benjamin Chen, who's a, a very successful uh, tech entrepreneur. And we're working on a book about um, using martial arts principles in, in sort of business and in life, these ideas of being efficient and being effective and strategizing and being adaptive and being present and all, all these different things. So those Howder's book and, and Ben's book are the, the two things I'm working on right now, mostly. How far are we mostly. out from uh, from Chris Outer's book? That sounds, I mean, for me, that I, I, I he's a great follow. He's a great follow on, <laughs> on Instagram. He's, yeah. uh, he's fun, is you know. So, well, so the currently we are. Um, I, I I have a draft. So we, we you've gone through several. You know, the the process is produce a first draft kick it back and forth, sort of come to some sort of meeting of the minds on content and format and form and all those things. Um, and so we're now at the point where we have a draft that I feel is um, pretty good. I, I, I'm going to give it one more, I would give it one more pass uh, and, and tinker with a few parts of it, but I, I, I feel like that, that draft is in pretty good shape. Um, Chris is reading that right now, and he's supposed to get his comments and his kind of line edits back to me um, sometime in the next um, month or so. He, he's had it for a month, and it's a pretty long book, so it's going to take him a little bit of time to get through it. But I'm very hopeful that um, by sort of early, by spring of next year, it'll be out and available. Um, <laughs> I was very hopeful that it was going to be out by spring of this year as well. So, um, <laughs> oh, you, you just heard me talk about Academy Save. It's never, it's never how you plan. Right. right, right. <laughs> uh, you know, hey, we're launching. We we had a countdown and everything, and now it's just like, where's the web? <laughs> the website's up. It doesn't work. <laughs> oh no. Uh, but I mean, it, you know, we we it, I was doing it by kind of invites at least initially. So I had a, a, like a nice waiting list. So actually one of our waiting list guys got on and was like, I'm, I'm having a problem here. And it, he found, he found a bug on one of the, but somehow the bug kind of infected everything else. Oh, no. So, so yeah, listen, it's, we, we, we were quick. We got everything up quick. It's not even the part that I can control. You know, it's a whole, I mean, and sure. then, it is literally NBC universal bought up all these like little background check companies. So um, it's, it's their platform. It's actually used for like little leagues around the country. So like you can have coaches come on, the refs, you go in, you do the safe sports certification, everybody gets a background check, you can yeah. record it all, right? So we're modifying it to what we need in, in martial arts because it's all of martial arts, not just jujitsu. And uh, so I don't know, I guess whatever little modifications we tried to make 
kind of caused some other problems because the whole platform know. isn't down. Just we're we're the we're down. So oh, anyway, so I, yeah, I get it. Like you know, time. Yeah, I I own a marketing company. That's the day job. So we're always building website. I mean. You know, most of the time for us, it's like the client screws up the timeline. They don't get right. us something. They're they're reviewing. They're doing something, but um, it's never the time. Like you know, I tell I give them big timelines. I'm like thirty to sixty days, as long as you get back to me in time. You know, so uh, yeah. the quicker you get back to me, the quicker it gets done. So I, I kind of know those, but it's there's always going to be a hiccup, and I, I don't I don't even let that stuff get to me. After 18 years, I don't I'm just like go with the flow. I, I know it's going to happen. I've kind of factored it into right. my time frames with the client, but. But well, that's great, man. It's uh, you, you kind of found uh, from fiction writing to the jujitsu side. I mean, you know, you know, maybe you found this little niche. Of, you know, you continue to to write with some of these uh, the, these people that you're talking about. We've had we've had uh, Robert Drysdale on. Uh, I didn't get to re I didn't get to read the book before I interviewed him. So I actually I said uh, I'm I'm more of like a a podcast and an audio book guy so he was like we're recording it we're recording it i'll get it to he did get me the the uh, the the uh he sent me the the amazon link and, and i downloaded it i haven't listened to it yet okay uh, but uh i have it <laughs> so i I'm, I'm going to costa rica for a bjj retreat this next week i'm like i'm catching up on my reading and my podcast and and probably that's probably going to be a good one to listen to while i'm while i'm traveling so uh yeah. You yeah, know, for but, sure. I mean, yeah. that's a that was a fascinating, fascinating yeah. project. Like, yeah. that's a, that's a really cool book. Yeah, I, I I I actually started reading it, and then it's just kind of one of those things where it's just like, you know, the, I, really at the time running two different businesses, the podcast being one of them, the marketing company it gets very difficult to like sit down and like turn off the phone and do anything because everything's related to social media online, you right. know. So anyway, just excuses. I guess you can find time for things that you want to do. So um, hopefully on this, uh, you know, it's a, I'm having a couple of good travel days. So I'm, I'm hoping to sit around and uh, and listen to it while I'm traveling. And then, you know, maybe uh, on the beach sipping some margaritas in Costa Rica after training. And I'll, uh, I'll get to yeah. throw the earbuds in. So, but that's great, man. I, you know, congratulations on, on the success of these books. And, uh, you. you know, I hopefully, uh, you know, love to. Listen, you know, when you uh, when you put out Chris's book, uh, if you want to come back on, you're, this is you're always welcome. And, um, you know, Appreciate bring it. him on, come on separately. We can do a little promoting uh, like we did with Richard. And, uh, here He's we go. got to fly down here, though. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he was going to say he's yeah. got he's got to let me record the audio book. He's got to let <laughs> me produce the audio book. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's great. I mean, again, you know, you wind up finding that, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I, I say this to clients, like sometimes the business steers, meaning like you don't know where it's going to sure. go. And sometimes it just tells you where to go. So it kind of sounds like, you know, you may not have thought you were going to be a jujitsu writer. Uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes the world just says, listen, there's something here for you. This is maybe what you're kind of meant to do. Um, so so tell me, like, so you you, you were a creative writer. You, you went to college for, for writing. Yep. When did you find jujitsu in, in, along your path? How long have you been training? So I, I found jujitsu in 2006. Um, I was, uh, I was in another martial art in, so I started in high school when I was, a, I think I just turned 17. I started, there was a school in town teaching a, a style, Korean style called Kuksul Do. Um, that was sort of similar to Hapkido. It was like, uh, kicks and punches and forms and standing joint locks, that sort of thing. Um, and so I was, I was trained, I, I was really into that. I was, I trained kind of constantly from the point that I started. Um, and then I went away to school and I would come back and train in the summers and, and stuff like that and train at like the Taekwondo club when I was at school. And then when I, when I graduated in 2005, I kind of spent the rest of that year. I stayed out. I was in Colorado for school. So I stayed out in Colorado that summer and then kind of spent the next little bit bouncing around. And then when I got back home, I came back home in, in um, like in early 2006, my, all the, all my training partners at the Kuk Sodo Academy were getting super into the ultimate fighter. Cause that had just come out. Right. And they were all really interested in, you know, learning jujitsu and adding in Muay Thai and adding in these different things. And there was, I think there was, there's kind of a period of this idea that like, we all still believed in Kuk Do, but we wanted to add these things that we felt like were 
you know, maybe Cooksville did go, Doe didn't have any grappling, and so we wanted to add that in and those sorts of things. And uh, my my buddy Jason uh, Zakrychek, the head instructor at that academy, he's like, we got to find we got to find a jujitsu instructor. And there was a purple belt in in Cleveland at the time named Donald Park, who was a um, Hoyler affiliate. And so Jason started going and training with him, and started bringing back what he was being taught and teaching us. And eventually, Don, Donald moved to Chicago pretty soon after that. Uh, and one of his blue belts, a guy named Darren Branch, who's now also Hoyler Black Belt, um, took over that school. And so Darren, uh, Jason started bringing Darren into our school to teach. I started going up to Darren's to train with them and basically it got more and more in love with MMA and then more and more in love with jujitsu and sort of less and less in love with Cooksville Doe and sort of there was a there was a little handoff process <laughs> and so um happens to so many people right right so whatever that was 18 years ago something like that okay um 2006 what is it it's, it's almost 2025 20, 20, 20, so, yeah, 18, 19. yeah we got another month so that that was kind of the the beginning and then we <clears throat> Jason there was a there was a big idea that you know MMA was going to be there you know there was that time period where it seemed like MMA was going to just take over and all traditional martial arts were going to go by the wayside and so Jason had this idea that he was going to open up an MMA gym uh as sort of like a uh, a parallel business to the Cooksville Doe Academy and so he sort of rented out the next door unit. We put in a cage, we put in heavy bags and all the stuff. And so Darren would come teach there uh, one day a week. We had a, a kickboxing instructor coming in and teaching one day a week. And then I started teaching these sort of like general skill MMA classes and workouts. Um, and then that evolved as, you know, te teaching MMA, MMA gyms are, I mean, we all know this, right? It's like, it's hard to kind of, have a sustainable business teaching MMA fighters. Like you need more accessible classes to more people. And yeah. Um, so the, the business model sort of shifted and I sort of, as I became more and more sort of enamored of, of jujitsu and realizing the intelligence of this strategy of, of jujitsu, I sort of got less and less interested in, um, not less than less. I love Muay Thai. I really enjoyed Muay Thai, but I started finding that I, I reached a point basically where I said, like, I can't really be a senior rank in jujitsu who also is telling people that jujitsu is in a, I, I, uh, insufficient. Mm -hmm. Like that, that, that I, I, I just, I, I took, I, I know a lot of people do. I know a lot of people are like, well, you need, you need everything. But I felt like it was, I felt personally like it was disrespectful for me to teach this jujitsu class and and immediately teach the implication that like you. So I, I and I and I sort of so I started moving away from Muay Thai and I started just teaching jujitsu classes and uh, got deeper and deeper and more and more in love with jujitsu basically. As time went on, so are you, you kind of saying? Yeah, am, is, I, am it, I losing you? No, we we got you. It, you got a little okay. you got a little jumpy there for a little bit. Um, okay. Um, Unlock the power of your online presence with Black Belt Digital Marketing. Their reputation management program ensures your Google business profile seen by more potential customers. Black Belt Digital Marketing is your full service digital marketing agency specializing in local SEO and reputation management. Boost your business today. Visit bbdigitalmarketing.com. Your success is their priority. Miss your morning routine, Bio Pro. Special thank you to the crew over at Flow and Roll for all their support. Flow and Roll is renowned for their incredible Nogi rash guards, shorts, and leggings. Flow and Roll has quickly become the premier custom apparel provider for academies big and small throughout the United States. Reach out today to discuss your custom order and ask about their incredible pre-order program. 
You can send an email to flowenroll at gmail.com or visit their Instagram at flow underscore n underscore roll and shoot them a direct message. And yes, they can create an awesome custom gi for your academy as well. Visit flowenroll.com to check out their awesome designs. And remember, you'll get 20% off your purchase of t-shirts, rash guards, or gis with code JJD. So, do, I mean, do you still feel that way? Do you still feel like, I, I guess what I'm taking away is, if we're teaching people to just like this can work even against, you know, a stronger opponent, maybe I don't know what I want to say, a more skilled and another disciplined opponent, um, your jujitsu should be able to stand up against that. Right. So then if you're teaching MMA, you're saying like, don't just depend on jujitsu, but I feel like we can just depend on the jujitsu and I can fight somebody with hands. Like if I get my hands on Christian, I'm going to destroy him. <laughs> <laughs> right, I mean, I, I mean, right. Now, I'm, I'm teasing. He's half my age. He probably kicked my ass. Um, uh, you know, right. I mean, that's what we're kind of saying. Like, there's this. It's like, oh, if I'm, I'm saying this, but I'm, I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth. Kind of, if I'm, if I, if I'm doing both, I, yeah, I think I mean, there is a, yeah. a, there is a place yeah. for MMA. You know, there, there, there is that. There's that argument for knowing a little bit of everything, but knowing a lot of jujitsu. And every aspect of the jiu-jitsu, I think, is just as powerful as knowing a little bit of everything. Am I agree, disagree? Like, I do, uh, no, I, I well, I guess maybe, let's, okay, let's talk through this. I, at the time, so I was like a purple belt and a brown belt in jiu-jitsu when we really made this shift where, okay, I, I feel like I, I can't, I, I, I was, I was, honestly, I was less, interested in Muay Thai mm -hmm. um, I was I was my, my interest was waning but my interest in Muay Thai was waning at a time when my my understanding of the reasoning behind the the sort of fight strategy of Gracie Jiu Jitsu was increasing so those those they were related uh, trends um, but the the transition was really happening at a time where I said if I'm going to become a black belt in Gracie Jiu Jitsu, then I should proceed with an absolute uh, fervent belief that this is the best martial art. And because if, if I don't believe that, then why am I doing it? If I don't believe that, then why am I expecting to be ranked in it? Why am I expecting to receive a senior rank so that I can turn around and say, as a representative of this art, that this art isn't, I, gotcha. I, I shouldn't expect that. That doesn't make any sense. So at that time, I was very passionate in that belief. Um, so now we, we extend that out farther. Do I believe, so it, I mean, we, we extend it out in time. Where do I, what do I think now? 10 years, 12 years, 14 years later. I think that, um, the strategy, the logic of saying, I don't want to trade hands with people because in trading hands with people, I maintain a type of engagement and a distance that always puts me at some level of risk. And that level of risk can be mitigated by closing the distance, establishing a clinch, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. Um, I, I, I certainly believe in the logic of that. Um, so participating in a striking strategy or, or practice is sort of philosophically opposed to, to that understanding. So it, I, I, I probably am, am not going to do that. Uh, however, I would say that that only works if I train jujitsu in a way that puts me at a very high level of familiarity with dealing with strikers, right? So I might put myself in an environment where I am constantly dealing with striking style engagement so that I develop a very high level of understanding of, of this, of this type of situation. It, it, another way to put it is like this. I, after I got my black belt in jujitsu, I started training in judo and I had sort of the same, I, I didn't have the concern uh, where I was saying jujitsu isn't enough. 
I need to go train judo. But I saw how from the outside people would have the same uh, understanding of my behavior. And, and so the way I would explain it to people is throwing people is a facet of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Being very effective in the clinch is a facet of Gracie Jiu Jitsu. But oftentimes in Gracie Jiu Jitsu, we don't have a practice where we truncate the parameters of our engagement to just that facet of it. You know, we, even if we're going to do takedowns, we do one takedown and then we grapple for the rest of the round oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's two clinch and two throws, uh, two, two clinch engagements and two throws in the course of a five minute or a seven minute roll. Whereas in a judo class, I cut out all the grappling part of it and I can spend five minutes just in the clinch getting very familiar with that body of knowledge, just in the throws getting very familiar with the, that body of knowledge. So it was about putting myself in a venue where a facet of my jujitsu was being hyper-focused on. Mm -hmm. And so even though I wouldn't say um, that I would necessarily go to a boxing gym to learn how to box, uh, I could see saying, look, part of Gracie Jiu Jitsu is knowing how to deal with somebody who's coming at you with punches. Uh, some, it's dealing with somebody who's coming at with you with kicks. And in order to have a very high level of application of that strategy, you need to be developing it so in a context where that skill set can really develop. Um, so I would say training in these other martial arts if you're using them as venues for exploring your jujitsu skill set, um, gotcha. that martial art as itself. However, there's a logic to saying you can't really understand the art until, like, for example, I can't really understand how to beat Muay Thai until I am good at Muay Thai. And I understand as an aggressor how I would be using these tools to beat somebody. Then as a defender, I can understand what he needs. And so I, I guess I'm much less dogmatic about it now um, as a student because the idea is that I'm trying to gather as much information about um, human unarmed one-on-one -on -one conflict as possible. And each one of these things is going to show me something about that or help me develop a skill set around it. However, I, I do fundamentally go back to this idea that disengaged, sort of distance-based, striking-based arts carry an inherent risk that um, clinching can mitigate, which is sort of the foundation of all the grappling and the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu strategic philosophy. And so I, I I, I do still believe that quite strongly. Different conversation than saying, I want to be a professional MMA fighter and I want to make sure I get a title shot as quickly as possible. That means being exciting. That means being this and that and having the big knockouts and having the skill set that really impresses people. And it's only a five minute round, so grappling strategy doesn't work as well. And the ref will stand us up, so it doesn't work as well. So. The, the rule set favors the striker and not the grappler. And so there's different contexts in which using those tools makes more sense. Um, so I think, I think I'm a little bit more maybe open-minded in general around it than I was when I was a brown belt. Um, but personally, for me, I think my, my, my approach remains the same. Tell us a little bit about your school. Tell us a little bit about Enclave. Uh, I did see, I think, on your Instagram it does say judo and jujitsu. Are you teaching both there? I'm, yeah. So when I designed that, <laughs> that logo, uh, I had, I think I had kind of maybe just gotten a, no, that's not true. Um, there, there was a, there was a point in time where I felt like I wanted to honor the connection to judo and to reclaim no re reclaim the connection to judo meaning classic kodokan judo is striking throwing and grappling and i i i i i, I love that right i think that's that's 
That's the, this, that's the martial, that's the mixed martial arts, right? That's, that's every context of engagement that two unarmed people end up in and having the skills to, to succeed in a combat, in, in a, in a confrontation, uh, in each of those venues. So I was regrounding in what I felt like was the, the thinking around the martial arts that was in judo and then that carried through sort of genetically through jujitsu. And I think that was why I wanted to bring emphasis to those two things. Um, but realistically, I mean, one of the things I, I often talk about um, with training with, with Hickson is that like in my experience, Hickson is one of the least precious about Gracie Jiu Jitsu people I've ever trained with, right? So meaning you meet many people who, you know, we do the technique like this because this is Gracie Jiu Jitsu. This is what Gracie Jiu Jitsu is. This move is Gracie Jiu Jitsu. This self-defense is Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And in my experience, Hickson is, so meaning that there's a context called Gracie Jiu Jitsu that we're all trying to, to perform effectively. And the truth is, and the truth that I feel like Hickson is always grounded in is, there's a fight. There's two human beings who are unarmed who want to defeat each other. So whatever is effective and efficient in that context is the right answer. And Gracie Jiu Jitsu should be a set of tools that help you succeed here. If it's not, and it starts becoming its own dogma, we're moving away from it being a, an effective martial art. Um, and so my overall philosophy at Enclave Jiu Jitsu is that the truth is in the fight. It's not necessarily in the art. The art should be showing us truth about the fight. But sometimes the art becomes the art. Sometimes we become so focused on doing the move or doing the script or doing what this guy said or that guy said that we lose the fact that we have a more direct relationship with truth sometimes by just saying what's the fight what's the context what's the you know when i do that move the guy can resist me i feel like the guy can re resist me i feel like the guy can defend well that's the truth if you tell me like well no it can't it doesn't work you should be able to be well yeah but i can't so how do I make a solution to the truth and not get lost in thinking about the, the, the art's answer necessarily? Even though I, I, I should always, I mean, I, ideally the art is uh, an, an, a, a, a reliable and an intelligent system of solutions to problems. But you, we all know how sometimes it gets lost and confused and muddied and, and obscured and handed down in weird ways. And we get lost in thinking, well, this should work, or I was told this should work, or I was told this is the answer. And we get in a lot of confusion thinking I gotta ask a teacher what the answer is, when maybe the answer is just say, okay, what's, the guy's big, he's grabbing my head, it's very hard to deal with it. What is the thing that makes me feel more comfortable? What's the thing that makes me feel more stable? What's the thing that makes me feel these things? And by finding those things, we discover the truth that oftentimes is in the technique, but that if we just repeat the technique, we might never have found. Um, so I, I, I guess in, in, in saying judo and jujitsu, it's like, what do I teach? Well, I, I teach people how to deal with striking. I deal how to teach people how to deal with clinching. I do teach people how to deal with grappling. And I teach them how to apply a grappling strategy in a fight confrontation. Um, if we want to call that Gracie Jiu Jitsu, if we want to call, I mean, my teachers are, my teachers are Hickson and Steve Maxwell, both of, and Steve was Helson's first black belt. So it's, it's Gracie strategy, it's Gracie technique, it's Gracie lineage. Um, but it's, it, it's in some ways more essential than saying I'm teaching Gracie Jiu Jitsu in the way, same way Jiu Jitsu to itself is talking about something more essential than Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Um, does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. understanding. I'm following you. Um, 
it, I, I kind when I'm when I'm hearing you say that, I'm kind of like what I said about the business steering before. It's sometimes the fight's going to steer you where it needs to go. If I'm standing there with like somebody I know is a wrestler, okay, we're going to be grappling. If mm -hmm. I know the guy's like just a boxer and likes to stand on the feet, okay, I've got to, yeah, I need to, you know, grab him and take him down. I, you know, I mm -hmm. need my judo, right? Uh, Christian's pointing at me like he's going to be the boxer in, in our fight. <laughs> uh, I mean, again, you know, sometimes, you know, the, I, I do think, you know, I, you said something before and I, and I've kind of said this, you, you talked about your, uh, your, uh, the, the owner of the first academy that you went to, like realizing like there was this MMA component. And we've had this kind of discussion here quite a bit where we say like, is MMA the new art? Like, is that, are those the gyms that are going to be the most successful? Um, I, I used to say, yeah. And now I think differently because I think that you eliminate the smaller kids Right. If you just had an MMA academy and you're telling mm -hmm. everybody they have to throw hands and they have to kick and they're going to spar, you're going to turn off moms that want to have their kids in something like, again, more of the, the gentle art that is jujitsu. And then you're going to turn off women, uh, you know, who maybe just want to learn a little self-defense. And again, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, more. Oh, I can see myself grappling, but I can't see myself getting hit in the face so that you kind of eliminate that. And I even my old school that I, I'm, I'm not at anymore, uh, I'm, I'm at a new school locally in my town. But the previous school, I used to say, I, like, I don't think that I don't think that you could have long term success unless you introduce some stand up. And it's very much a like sport jujitsu school. Um, and he's had a lot of trouble keeping students mm. um, for for some other reasons. But it's also it's so hyper focused on sport jujitsu. But there aren't enough people competing. Like, you know, we're down here in South Florida, that, like uh, the RMA, right? Wagner is the school down here. You want to compete, whether you're a kid or an adult, forget about what you think about Wagner and all the bullshit that happened with fight sports. He's the place. Mm -hmm. Like, you want to do, you want to make a name for yourself in sport jiu-jitsu. Even if you're training at your school, you go there. That's the place. It's just where all the kids, the you know, there there's like Team Alpha Miami and my, you know, a little further down south and things like that that are that are big here now as well. Um, but that's the school, and mm -hmm. he just does, he just teaches sports jujitsu. There is no, I don't, I don't believe there's any stand up at VRMA. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's just that. So like, yeah, you can go and you can learn that, and that could be the thing. And it's not necessarily self defense. Like people are going because they want to become great in sport jujitsu. Right. Um, but my old school, like, you're not big in sport jiu-jitsu but you're only teaching sport jiu-jitsu i think that you need to introduce some stand-up or some stand-up some traditional of like the gracie elements of that stand-up and the, the stand-up defense and that mm -hmm. doesn't get taught it's like let's sit on our butts and let's start grappling right mm -hmm. so um so there are schools out there like that and i think i you know again unless you have a very very strong you know in the case of wagner's i mean he's made a name for himself and then he made his school if you don't have a name for yourself and you're trying to make your, it's very difficult to just become this amazing coach without having done it yourself. You have a, sure. you have a, there's a, there's a much longer line to toe. There's a much, you have a, it's a, it's a much more difficult to, to, you know, what do they say? Like those who can't do teach well in jujitsu, it's kind of hard to really build your brand. If you haven't, you can't point at the wall and say, those are my belts. Those are my medals. This, you know, this is the Certainly. thing I do. Certainly. So I'm not saying it's impossible. It becomes more difficult. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where, you know, from a gym perspective, for just from a running an academy perspective, this is an out, you know, so I've trained for 10 years. I'm like on the outside of owning an academy looking in. Mm -hmm. I feel like the academies down here in South Florida, at least that do well, uh, do well and can hold more students are the ones that do mix it up a little bit where there's a stand up element, even if it's not full Muay Thai or full kickboxing classes, introducing that element into the ground game. Mm -hmm. My first school had. Uh, you know, we called it MMA classes on Tuesday and Thursday and Tuesdays and Thursdays, but it was essentially like, you know, very light sparring and entries into, you know, takedowns and, and less throws, but more into just takedowns. Mm -hmm. And then it was all about the grappling. You know, like you said, you know, you're on, you, would you say like two throws or two grappling engagements, but, or, or not, what did you say? Two throws and two yeah, like clinching, around clinching two, engagements, right? right? Yeah. And then, you know, it's. 30 seconds on the feet, five and a half minutes. On, I mean, we do six minute right. rounds at my place. So it's right. like, you know, 
five five and a half minutes on 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 the ground versus thirty seconds on your feet in those in those two throws and those grappling engagements or those uh, those clinching engagements. So, I don't. Again, again, I there, there was a, there was a, a while there I was just like you yeah, can't be successful unless you're running an MMA academy. But then I realized as I got a little bit older and just older in the sport really more than anything, that yeah, you turn there's a whole group of people that you'll turn off. But there, you know, there's a there's a that's a product for one group. You know, there's this other product. See, if I ever opened a gym, I would focus on the jujitsu. It's the thing that I love, and I think that that comes across. It's the thing that I could coach the best. Mm -hmm. I've done a little stand up, but that's not my thing. I do love coaching jujitsu. And then, you know, listen, these days, the uh, some, you know, somebody asked this, actually asked this question. This might be a good time to ask it, but, you know, being able to. You know, the old school way of like, you come here like this, well, you have one master, you know, you come to this school and that's it. You don't go anywhere else. And I mean, that's completely changed. You know, mm -hmm. cross training is probably one of the best things you can do. Getting going to open mats, going to other gyms and getting other looks doesn't mean that you have to leave the gym that you love or what have you. But um, this question came from I don't know if you know them, uh, bar down G uh, BJJ bar down BJJ on Instagram. It says, as the creator of Enclave Jiu-Jitsu, what advice would you give a student on navigating the coaching slash mentor-student relationship outside of their local home gym where they may be a daily member? So like, again, we're talking about how do you, are you okay with your students training in other places and, and how would you navigate that or what advice would you give to somebody who's navigating that, uh, that kind of unique relationship with a coach? Yeah, so uh, I, Enclave Jiu-Jitsu is a private facility i mean th this space that i'm in here is a mm. small space where i pretty much teach private lessons and then mm. i have a small group that i train with personally and when i created this space this space i created it with the idea that you know i'd been a, a an instructor for pretty much the entire time i was in jujitsu right it was like I would, there were many times where I was like three months ahead of the students I was teaching. And I was, I was always very open about this. I was always like, you know, if you have questions that I can answer, I'm going to give you an answer. If I don't, if I can't answer you, I'm going to tell you that. And I'm, but I'm going to go ask my teachers and I'm going to come back with an answer for you. Um, so in the beginning, it was, it was, um, you know, it was, it was a little bit the blind leading the blind, but, um, but the point is that I was, I was, I, I, I never quite, and maybe this was just my sense of it, but I never quite had the space where I was only worried about my own development. I was only worried about like just being completely selfish about getting what I wanted to get out of the training. There was always an element of figuring out how I'm going to teach it, how I'm going to understand it so I can teach it to people. Like there was always a, a sense of the responsibility of my development was partially for me, but in being for me, it was for what I could give back, give to my students. And um, eventually I found that to be a very frustrating place um, for, for a few different reasons that we don't need to go into. But I wanted to create a space where I could just kind of be among a group of people who I would consider peers, even if I was technically ahead of them in rank, uh, where it was more of like a, a collaborative space than it was a, was a formal instructional space. So that's a long way of saying, I don't quite have that issue here because this is a voluntary community, or it was very much intended to be a voluntary community. And people could, add value to me by going off training with other people seeing different perspectives and then bringing it into our next conversation that was part of the idea was to to bring in the diversity of perspectives um so this space maybe embraced that and was allowed to embrace it more than a commercial gym or a traditional commercial gym in the traditional commercial gym environment, it, it, you know, it, it, there are ways in which I feel like jujitsu it, it doesn't have a comfortable relationship with market capitalism. Mm 
right? <laughs> because oftentimes we're, we're, <laughs> we're creating family, we're creating community, we're creating loyalty, we're creating all these things. And there are just different motivators and incentive systems that don't always harmonize with each other. And so, for example, if I'm trying to develop a brand, right, because there's a market, there's a limited market share, and my particular insights about jujitsu and my particular perspective on jujitsu are my value add, and I give those to my students, and my students go and they give them to other people, they've taken my value add and given it away, and now they've taken potential customers from me. Now, maybe they've attracted potential customers because they, those, those students who my students share with have seen, oh, there's a value at Scott's gym. I want to go train with Scott. Oh my God, this guy told me a thing Scott said, and it was so great. I want to go see if Scott has anything else to, to say that's intelligent. Um, but there, there, there is, there is maybe a, a risk of, uh, you know, it's kind of like in a little bit, maybe it's like this idea of like a country without a border is not a country. It's like, if I need to build this business, then I kind of need to keep stuff inside it. If it all goes out, then it's not a business anymore. And it loses value. Yeah, maybe. Um, it's, I, I don't know. Jujitsu, like, obviously this is part of the dynamic tension of this art that sort of, I don't think it's going anywhere, right? Because you see some people are like, no, absolutely, you can't train anywhere else. And then other people say, go train everywhere. Um, and both of them have a lot to offer. And then both of them have a lot, they have, have, have limitations, right? Um, I mean, I try to be as open-minded about and, 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 and curious and, and developing as possible, but I'm always going to be limited because of the way I think, because of the, the things I'm focused on, the things I'm interested in. My development is always going to be within one particular lane. And if you only ever train with me, even if what's in that lane is good, um, it's still just my lane. Um, and so I, that's something that I, I have to acknowledge. On the flip side of it, I think a lot of people, a lot of students who, who feel like, oh, my coach doesn't want me to train anywhere else. And that's really controlling. And that's really like culty and all this stuff. They've never been in the position of being a coach and giving so much time and thought and energy and emotion into a student and, and saying like, man, it took me so many ass kickings and so much work to get this knowledge. I give you this knowledge that is like, literally, it's like the most precious thing I have. It was certainly the hardest to get and I'm giving it to you. And then you take it away and you act like you don't owe me. Maybe owe is too strong a word, but you don't that the, or, or appreciation that would make me say, man, I would really feel like I was, I was being unappreciative of Scott if I went and just trained somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, if that doesn't click because you've never been in that position, I, I, I do understand instructors feeling um, taken for granted or be betrayed, maybe too strong a word, but having a little bit of that feeling. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't know what, what the, the best answer. I mean, I think probably the ideal solution is to create an environment that is so fulfilling or to attract the people who are fulfilled by your environment that them wanting to train somewhere else is not really an issue. And that the people who want to train somewhere else, you say, well, great, then you should probably go train somewhere else. But the people who train here, train here because they want to. I'm not telling anybody not to leave. Yeah. But they, they just want to keep showing up because they like it. They like the training. They like the, the, the teaching. Um, I mean, that's the ideal situation. If I have to keep somebody here, I'm holding back something that isn't going away. 
Yeah. And it's probably going to grow into a bigger issue. But this is, again, how the incentive system of market capitalism sort of skews the situation, because in a perfect world, like I reached a point with the, the fight gym, the previous gym I was running, where I said, I'm not everybody's instructor. The way I communicate, the way I think about jujitsu, it's not what everybody wants. Um, it's not what everybody connects with. It's not how everybody learns. So if you don't connect with the way I teach and you don't learn, you should go find a teacher who teaches the way you learn. You are going to be happier. You're going to have better progress. You're going to have more uh, fulfillment from your training. That teacher is going to have a better experience. But at the same time, if that teacher gets a student who really doesn't connect with them and might connect with me, they should say, oh, go train with Scott. Right. And that's how it should work because everybody should find their home. Right. And it's not about the best place. It's about the best place for you. Sure, but yeah. because I got to pay the rent and because I got to keep the lights on and all those things, I want to keep all the students, whether they're like the right student for me or not. You know, so go ahead, go ahead, finish your thought. No, I'm no, sorry. no, that, that was, that was the whole thought. So, so one of the things that I love about the gym, I've moved gyms a few months ago. Um, I'm at a place called, uh, Coral Springs BJJ and I was going to, there were three gyms that I was going to check out when I left my school. It, mm -hmm. One was American top team in, uh, there was a new American top team in Coral Springs. There's a silver Fox BJJ and then the one, and then Coral Springs BJJ. And I had a friend there. I said, let me go to Coral Springs BJJ first. He's some, I know somebody there. Let me go check him out. And I went there. And immediately kind of like uh, fell in love with the environment. I okay. I like a Lucy, a Lucy goosey, not super traditional uh, environment. Um, there was a certain level of respect that they've taught their students to have for the black belts. I'm a new black belt. It was just people coming up to you, shaking their hand and, you know, no, nothing more than that. Nothing like putting anybody on a pedestal, but like. You know, somebody walks in the class, all the students, they, they, they're told to, you know, go around and say hello and like, kind of bow into all of the all of the black belts that are there. And there's usually sometimes like five to ten black belts on the mat, which is great. And I went, I went and I, I went for the first week and I went to an open mat. And what I discovered was that all the other gyms that I was going to go to come to this gym for their open mats. And I said, OK, this is interesting. And then I noticed that kid, people were coming for the instruction as well. Like, uh, you know, I just wanted to. They just would come for instruction during a regular weekday, non open mat situation. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. What I found was that the, they were such a well-respected gym in the area that the other gyms that I wanted to get to come to this gym and mix up their training with this gym. So like, this is kind of the spot where I felt like people congregated a little bit. I was just like, oh, I'm going to get to train with those people, that coach from that gym. And I'm going to get to train with this guy from over here and, and a whole bunch of other gyms that I didn't even know and, uh, or that I wasn't going to go to. And I felt like I had a really... Uh, just it, it was just a really fun environment. I was given the opportunity to like you know show some moves and do a little coaching, which I love. I'm, I'm like a natural like trainer teacher. I do it with my you know with with my businesses. I'm the trainer. I I love that. I love just imparting knowledge and and I don't know it all, but if I can help somebody, I love to help. And my point here was going to be, I almost feel like if you could be that gym that everybody wants to go to, you know you're not gonna have a lot of people going out. Like it's like to be, I feel like the gym that I'm at now is so open to anybody coming there to train that we don't go out to those other places because they're all coming to us. Mm -hmm. So like it's kind of that in the community, they're the school that's been there probably one of the longest and so many people, um, you know, just come come to, to us. And those other schools are incredibly open to anybody. If you ever wanna come, like no mat fees, no, like you've got to join or you can only come once in a while or it's only a free week. No, it's just like we can go back and forth and most people are here at your home gym and then you might stray once in a while, a couple of times a month. I just feel like my, the gym, and I don't think it was necessarily by design. It was by, it just happened again, steered the business, steered it into this place where it's become this, the gym in the community where most other gyms, if they want to go to an open mat or get a different look at something, they come here. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a, it, I, I feel like the choice that I made is incredible. I couldn't, my old gym, I couldn't figure why people didn't stay. I was there for eight years 
of my 10 years training, I was there for eight years and I couldn't figure out why do all the black belts get promoted and leave? Mm. Why is it oh, it's so many white belts? Where are all the color belts? Like, why did that girl leave? Why did this girl? And again, I found out one of the reasons I started Academy Safe, started to find out what was really going on. And I decided mm -hmm. I can't be at a place like this. And I left, but I couldn't figure that out. Why? You know, you kind of don't know what you don't know. I didn't know that the other gyms were like that. My first gym closed after two years. I was a blue belt. I was training, I was coaching at white belt, so I didn't see the environment. So my first school closes, so I didn't get, the only look I got was at this gym that I was at eight years. So you're thinking that this is the way it is everywhere. Then I start right. to do the podcast and I start to get, hear different opinions and views and I'm like, wait a minute, it's not like this everywhere. And I couldn't go train anywhere else because the coach would get annoyed or he didn't like somebody at another gym. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, wait a minute, it's not them, it's you. And it took eight, unfortunately it took eight years to really, really, truly realize that. But now I'm in a place where it's just like, oh, this is the way that it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. You know, you're supposed to be sharing that. When you've got five, 10 black belts on the mat and there's no ego and like, the other day I showed my coach a variation of something he was showing the class. I was like, you know, like if you put your leg here, look how much quicker it is. Like if you shoot your leg through and it was like an X guard and I'm not an X guard guy, but I'm like, look, if you shoot your leg, it, it's kind of quicker if you do it this way. And he was like, took me off to the side. He's like, show me. And mm. I'm showing this guy that's got a couple of stripes on his belt, something that I just do because I learned someplace else. And it was, I was, I told the others, two owners, I told the other owner, I'm like, I whispered to him. I'm like, Hey, you know, if you do it this way, I go, but you know, he was like, go show it, show it. And I go, I don't want to show it. It's disrespectful to my coach. You're still my coach. So that's mm -hmm. He's like, no, no, not here. Not here. Go. Mm -hmm. He's like, hey, guys, Milton wants to show you something. And I was like, got everybody rounded up. And it was like, no big deal. And I'm like, this is not what I'm used to. Sharing knowledge, a young, a, a new black belt sharing knowledge with black belts at, at, of higher rank. And some of them knew the move and they knew. But I was able to share. Some, I just haven't been part of that environment before. Mm -hmm. Other than at my first gym where I'm like literally coaching the kids class at White Belt. But I just hadn't been part of that. And that I, that's what I'm a part of. So again, you know, going back to what I said initially was like being that place. I'm at a gym where they are that place in the community that people want to come train to. Not nobody's stealing students. They still go back to their home gyms, but it's so open and it's so inviting that anybody can come. And again, they're like, come on through. The doors are open. So they become that place. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sad that I had, hadn't moved sooner and been a part of it for longer. But I'm there now. And it's a, it's a really nice environment, which I like. I thrive in that environment of being able to, I'm a, I talk for a living. I'm a salesperson. I run a podcast. So to put me in a room with people and I'm not allowed to share what I know or what I'm thinking is, is mm -hmm. difficult for my personality. It just is. <laughs> so when somebody says like, Hey, come on in. No, no show. Yeah. Can, show me show. Hey, you know, and that's not just me. It's anybody. Hey, yeah, yeah. Show, yeah. show that, show that move. Show let, let's understand that another look at this. It's just, I'm. Um, it's, in the world of jujitsu, I had not experienced that till till just this this last year, which is just really great. So, it's yeah. it's a like a fascinating like this 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 thing that we do where where we either open up or we close down, right? It's, it's kind of in everything, and it's so as humans or as jujitsu practitioners as as humans, humans yeah. right? As, as cultures, as communities, it's you when you. I think I don't, I'm not a big, I don't use this language a lot, but like this idea of the scarcity mindset and how the scarcity mindset makes me start to try to draw a wall around my stuff because I'm worried I'm going to lose it and then not have enough. Uh, but when I feel like I have enough or that I trust that I'll always have enough, I'm very open and generous. And the irony is that when I'm open and generous, it usually attracts more. Mm, yeah. Start, so this, this, and it's, it's so funny, like I've often sort of, cause I, you know, in, in whatever it is, you know, 18, 19 years, whatever I've been in jujitsu and then kind of just other communities and stuff, friend groups and groups in college and different stuff. It's interesting the way groups organically congeal, they come together and then they, they, they work and they're firing and it's, there's this synergy and then something shifts and it sort of falls apart and but then another group forms and another thing happens and, and you sort of have these moments and then the moments are over and when the moments start to end is oftentimes when people start to get very rigid around them they start to make rules around how we're going to keep this going 
And when you start to make the rules around it, it's just kind of mm. makes it something else. You didn't save yeah. the thing you, you thought you were saving. You made it something else. And so it's like when you, it's almost like you have to choose in that moment of feeling the threat. You have to choose to, to trust that something else is going to, something else is going to come and there are always going to be more people or anything that's leaving is actually making space for the next better thing. Um, but it, it, it's so interesting how that, that little, like, is like that drop of food coloring in the water where it, like that little drop of fear in the community will start to make people pull back from each other yeah. and not want to share and not want to let you go somewhere else or not like it when you go somewhere else. And yeah. why'd you show that guy that move? I showed you that. And like, it, it, it's, so it's, it's, a, it's interesting because on the one hand, it seems like a very fragile thing, right? But the reality is that it's an incredibly resilient thing, but the resilience only happens when things fall apart. Right. So yes, it's fragile, but it always comes back again. So like it's fragility. It's, is tempered by its resilience. It's kind of what you said there initially of, about like giving, like being open and giving in the business world. We, we, uh, I belong to a business referral organization and we call it givers gain. Hmm. So it's, we're a bunch of business owners. Each industry is represented by one person. I do the digital marketing. And it's like, I might give a bunch of referrals to um, the real estate lady. The real estate lady gives a whole bunch of referrals to the insurance guy or to the, mm -hmm. to the mortgage guy, right? She never gives me one referral. I give her tons. She never gives me anything, but she gives to the mortgage guy and the mortgage guy gives me a ton. Like we're mm -hmm. sharing the information. Um, and for me, like it's taught me to, like I give of myself, of my company, like I, try to feel like I try to, if I have a dime, you have a nickel. If you're my friend or you need it, if I have a dime, you're going to have a nickel. Mm -hmm. You know, I like, I want to, I, I aspire to be the guy that I'm going to, I want to give you the shirt off my back and not always that there's some, in the personal life, you got to, sometimes you need to do that. You can't do it when there's something in it for you. But in business, I do it to help people. And I want them to tell it, that guy helped me. Oh, that guy, you know, I need a website too. I should go to him. Mm -hmm. Right mm -hmm. in business, I want that. Right, so I give, I give, I give. I, I'll do free stuff for people. Um, I've done powerpoints for speakers. Nothing back. I, I, I shouldn't say that. Nothing back. Like I did it. Hey, I'm gonna do you the. And like, if you ever need anything, just let me know. If you know anybody that needs anything, like now that's a like a that's a something for them to be like, yeah, this guy did this for me. Oh, who did that? Oh, really? Maybe he could do that for me. Right? And then I get a paid client. So like, givers gain is like just give, 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 give. And it's going to come around because you're mm -hmm. giving it to this group that are like-minded. Like, I'm going to make sure that if I hear somebody saying they're selling their house and I'm going to sell, I'm going to get the real estate agent involved. Or if there's somebody that says, you know, I haven't been able to get my, more, like, I'm having a problem with the bank and my more, I got a guy, right? Mm -hmm. Let me, let me introduce you, right? So then I'm always thinking about these people. I'm giving, giving, giving. And hopefully they're going to do the same, whether it's their client, a family member, or they need something, right? So I give to like... I, I've tried to carry that over into my personal life, and I do believe it works because it's two things that happen. You kind of said this before, like you give information and then somebody takes it and then they go, they go give it to somebody else. In some cases, almost like it's their own. Mm -hmm. But then you kind of peel the layer back on that person, right? And be like, okay, now I understand who you are. Mm. Versus like, I teach you something and then you go, hey, I, got, I know a guy that needs to know this as well. Like, let me bring him in here to this group, bring him in. Right. Um, I, I think, you know, if somebody you're teaching people and then they go and teach it as if there's a, it's their own and they're a blue belt. It's like one that's like, really, buddy, you know, come on, you know, but bring that person in. Like if you know somebody that needs that help, hey, bring them in, bring them into the fold uh, versus like, you know, representing it your own. Or right. if you take it further, it's just like, um, you know, I, I, I forget about politics for a second, but I believe it was uh, it was like Michelle Obama that said like believe Michelle or, or, or Barack Obama said believe people who when they tell you who they are mm. right believe people when they tell you who you are and I kind of like added that to the mix as well if I'm doing for you whether it's business or personal and you just take 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 even when you don't need it but you're like oh he gives so let me take mm -hmm. then you've revealed yourself to me. But if right. you're somebody that says, hey, I'm going to pay, you did this for me and I'm going to pay it forward, that's a plus. I'm happy about that. Or, mm -hmm. hey, you did this thing for me. 
if you ever need anything, let me know. Or I, I can do that. I can help you with this, right? It's like the buddy that can help you move. Like you help him move. And then when you've got to move, he's just like, I'm busy. Right. <laughs> right? Like, right, but right. so like, you know, people reveal themselves. And I'm not saying you have to get rid of those people, but you kind of do. You reveal yourself in those moments when, especially when somebody's doing for you, doing for the community, and mm -hmm. you're not you're not giving back. I mean, that book doesn't that bring us full circle? Like Richard has done so much for this community. Hundred um, percent. Yeah. He's been around. I mean, like, you know, I I, I want to say this. I maybe it's a little bit more, but I, I said like I want to die on the mat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like I want to I want to be training as long as I can. I literally had two heart attacks after training. Just uh, like I've had oh, a heart attack. I've had two heart attacks. I wasn't falling on the floor. It's like chest pains. Like, what's this going? Do I am I gassy? What is it? Wound up being a heart attack seven years, eight years ago. Like, wow. but I've even after I've said like I want I legitimately like if I died on the mat in my eighties, <laughs> I would think I would have died a happy person. You know, I want my family to be around. I, I want all those things. But meaning that I love jujitsu so much that if I can do this for the rest of my life, where I am able to be mobile and or at least teach. I feel like aside from my family, I've done something. We know how it is. When you give that knowledge in jujitsu, it is extremely fulfilling. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see, when you teach somebody and then you see them do it and then they take it and they're like, wow, they, it's a, such an incredible feeling. So if I could be on the mats for the rest of my life, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. And obviously nobody wants to be in the position that Richard's in, but I know that he's lived that life. He's, he's drawn jujitsu his since, I don't remember the exact age, but I, from the book, right? He was working in his parents' burger shop and right. he wound up doing jujitsu and, and he's been doing it since then. I don't think, right? It's been nonstop in this nonstop, world. Yeah. He's mm -hmm. not been like taking breaks or took a, I don't, you correct me if I'm wrong, but it's never a time that he's took, t taken years off. No, he's like, been this teaching is, the whole time. He's in yeah. his seventies, he's mid seventies. Yeah, yeah, mid seventies. I mean, he's he's lived that life as it relates to jujitsu. And again, we said it earlier, like, you know, he's, probably taken way less than he's given to the world oh, of yes. jiu-jitsu you oh, know yes. in the form of accolades money you know sh mm -hmm. you know the glory but he supported a lot of people who did and Absolutely. um i think it's uh you know again i i think i would feel like richard would probably say he's lived that givers gain lifestyle i've given i've given i've given and uh, you know i've gotten back uh, mm -hmm. and now that this is a point where like even if he's not asking for it himself, like we can give, let's, let's do yeah. something. Let's give, let's put some shine on this. Yeah. Let's help him. Let's donate. Chance, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's, a, it's our chance to give back to somebody who's, who's given a, a, a ton to this world. So uh, Scott, yeah, I'm going to, well said. yeah, thank you. Thank you, man. Um, so we, we do this little thing at the end of the, at the end of each episode called the drill down. Sure. These are the most common questions I think I mentioned to you earlier. These are like the most common questions that we get. So I'm going to run through this. I like to get these from everybody because there's some uh, there's some good stuff in here so that people can kind of understand your your thoughts around jiu-jitsu. So okay. we'll run through these real quick. You can elab feel free to elaborate as much as you want on any of these. Okay. Uh, so let me let me do the official sound effects because our sound effects guy is in here. So it's time for... The drill down. We normally have a guy that does that. He's actually <laughs> does the drill down. So, okay. okay. So the first question is gi or no gi? What's your preference? Oh, uh, man. Um, I like them both. Probably gi, though. Yeah. So like, yeah. I, I, I usually say it like this. Like, if you're going on a trip and you know there's gi and no gi, you can go to a no gi school or a gi school. Which one, which, are you packing your gi? Well, yeah. <laughs> thank you for that wonderful segue because actually, uh, <laughs> my, a couple of a couple of years ago, my friends, my my training partners, and I started a company that makes travel gis. Oh yeah, called black market kimono. Hey, that's so the I am that. always bringing my black market kimono. They're made of ten ounce ripstop cotton, so they pack down very small. Okay, uh, so you can bring them to, to uh, on any trip you go on, even if you're only bringing a personal item on the plane. So <laughs> I am always packing a gi. So that wasn't that was in no way a setup. <laughs> I, had no, I saw the hat. I had no clue that that's what that was. To be honest, yeah. with you. <laughs> it sounded like we just set that up, didn't it? <laughs> okay, it was great. <laughs> okay. We cut this part out, so it just sounds like a plug, right? So okay, uh, take down or pull guard? Take down. All right. Music during rolling, yes or no? Yes. What's your go-to? What's your preference? Um, lately, it's been like, uh, well, 
like, um, well, let's see, lately it's been Childish Gambino radio or 90s alt rock radio. Okay. Yeah. I like Childish Gambino. Yeah. Did he, is he coming out with like one final album? I think he's I, doing something. I think right it's now. out. Is it out? But then he like, he canceled his tour. Like he doesn't, he, he's got some health issues going on. Or yeah. Something. He's, yeah, an, I, I mean, I, like, I, uh, a fan. And then like, the, you, uh, you know, like his singing voice is like, he could just like sing a cappella. Yeah. I've seen him on some videos that like he's done some like radio shows and things like that. It's an amazing voice. I mean, talk about like, <laughs> Trip, triple threat, quadruple threat, comedian, Seriously. actor, yeah. singer, rapper. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing. I'm a fan. Yeah, writer, director, incredibly yeah. talented. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Most, uh, what do we, so I, I adjusted this for the last podcast, but most annoying things that students do. <laughs> yeah, I, I always like to tell you mine. I'm that guy that's like, when the coach is like, I'm, I can't do that move. I'm, I, my, I'm too old. I can't do that move. My back. And the coach is like, just do the freaking move. Watch. I'm going to show you. And then, like, they'll help me, like, look, because of your body or your back, do it. Like, the, And then I do it, and I'm like, fuck. Like, but I'm that guy that's like, yeah, I can't. I'm not going to bear and bolo. I'm not going to do this. I, I'm not, I'm not going to invert. Like, I'm that guy that, like, says no to my coach. And then he's like, like, just do it. And then I do it. This is in the past. And then I'll do I'll be like, oh, shit, I can actually do that move. <laughs> I think I think probably, and this is probably true of of jujitsu and in general, uh, people who ask questions that aren't questions that they're just w w disguised way of telling you. <laughs> I might be that guy too. <laughs> 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 I might be that guy. As, you know, starting jujitsu older, like I wasn't a kid, like I had an opinion, and I was such a huge UFC fan, and I wrestled mm -hmm. a little in junior high, and I've been like hitting the bag like from forever in my house and like studying YouTube videos. So like I thought my, my, my coach asked me, he's like, what do you know about jujitsu? I stepped on the mat. He goes, what do you know about jujitsu? And I'm like, Oh, huge UFC fan. So I kind of got some of the basic, like he, he left, <laughs> he left. He's like, come here. And he put me in his clothes guard and proceeded to beat the shit out of me, you know? And, and like, <laughs> I beat the shit out of me, like throw me around. Like I was nothing. And we're like, this, like we're both like, uh, I think he was 260. I was like 230 at the time. So it was like, yeah, I, I guess I know nothing, you know. I'm probably that guy though too. Um, what would you be doing if you hadn't have found martial arts? I'm guessing maybe writing more, but what would you be doing if you didn't hadn't found martial arts? Um, yeah, I, I think I think I'd I think I'd be writing. Yeah. Um, pro I'd probably be rock climbing a lot more than I do now. Is that a that hobby that probably... is that a hobby that you that, that you pursue when you have time now? Yeah, I was I mean I was really into rock climbing in college. It's like part of the reason I went out west for school. So I think that would probably be my my main physical outlet if I wasn't doing jujitsu. Career though, feel like Career, you'd be writing more? I'd be writing, yeah. Yeah. I mean, ideally, you know, writing's a, a tough a tough gig. I didn't you know, didn't make any money at it for a long time. Yeah. So um yeah, I ideally yeah. I think, yeah, that's a whole other conversation, but, um, we'll yeah, save that for the next probably episode. writing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you somebody that watches a lot of like stuff online instructionals? Are you somebody that learns and like, I do like the one minute clips where I'm seeing a move that I might know and then just see somebody do it differently. Like, oh, okay. I like those different takes on it. I'm not somebody who's going to watch a multi-hour instructional. Are yeah. you somebody that watches stuff online or consumes jujitsu in that way? No, no, I'm not. But I, I watch a lot of fights and I, I feel like I, I, I watch them um, very much. Yeah, as we all do, looking, looking for, for the, gold, the little gold nuggets in there. They go, oh, yeah. my God, I didn't know you could. Oh, look, that combination, that approach, that strategy, that, um, that's probably my main uh, like supplemental material that I consume is, I mean, I, I do watch like, um, you know, Hickson's Academy, uh, his online instructional materials. I, wa I watch that religiously, um, because it's Hickson and because I'm in some of it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I gotta make sure I don't look like you a know, complete I gotta, fool. I gotta see it, yeah. make sure my hair look good. <laughs> uh, uh, right, exactly. Um, but uh, outside of that, no, I don't, I, I don't watch a lot of it. Okay. Are you, uh, how about, you, the, like we talked about MMA before, are you a UFC fan? Do you watch any of that kind of stuff? 
Do you watch yeah, competitions I mean, like uh, CJI and ADCC? Are you into any of that? I watched the CJI. I, I, had, I, don't, I never watched a lot of jiu-jitsu competition. I was really up on the UFC for a long time. I don't keep that current with it. I mean, I'll watch the, the Stipe fight coming up because he's, you know, local, local boy oh, done good. Cleveland, right? Yeah. Um, but, like, I, I loved watching uh, Pride. I I, I was like, that was how I got through COVID was I just watched all of pride over again. Yeah. And so, yeah. <laughs> all of it. <laughs> like all, Good. like pretty much yeah. all of it. <laughs> um, so, um, but then like, yeah, I, 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 what I started doing is I like, I have an aerodyne over here and I would like get on it, you know, and do like a, an hour on the aerodyne and just watch. Like I, I, I went on Facebook marketplace and would find these lots of people getting rid of like UFC and Pride DVDs, and I would just buy them for like forty-five bucks, and you'd get seventy fights. Really? Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm just working my way through them slowly. Wow. But yeah. What did you think? Uh, CJI versus ADCC. Did you have a preference as to the final product? Let's call it. I mean, I I have never watched an entire ADCC event. I've, so like, I loved the CJI. I thought it was super entertaining, and I loved the the uh, what did they call it the the alley. The alley, yeah. yeah. I thought that was really I neat. think that's a game changer. I think that might be a game changer for those yeah. type of competitions. I mean, obviously, I don't know what's going on with Mo and ADCC, but right. there's something that I feel is probably going to change. I mean, he even mentioned it, I think, before he announced that he was no longer going to be with the organization, but he might be in the background still. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think there's something there. I think that there's really something. The two things that I took away, the alley, mm -hmm. and then just the one match... I, you know, that, that it's a tournament, basically. ADCC is that tournament. So, you know, CJI is not the same kind of tournament. It's very, you know, a smaller tournament, you know, brackets. Mm -hmm. I just feel like that alley, no stop to the action, and then just being able to focus on a fight, unless you're the, even if you're there and you're trying to watch three fights, you don't get to take it all in. But there's so many competitors, so you have to do it that way, or do you? You know, could there be three alleys? Could there be multiple at like so many questions that I have? I'm so curious what happens in the next couple of years, but I definitely was, I, I watched CJI all the way through. And like you said, I can't, I've never watched a full ADC every match. Sure. Event. I, you just can't, but I, I definitely was more entertained than I, and I f f love him or hate him. Craig Jones has done something that I don't think anybody thought he was going to be able to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just, I like that little shake up every once in a while. I think it's nice to take a little box and shake it up and then say, see what, <laughs> and see what happens. Yeah. And sometimes what comes out the other side is, is beautiful. You know, yeah. I think, it, I think it was a great event. Well, I no. loved, like, I got super into Metamoris when they were doing those. And I okay. was really like, I really, I, I know other people have done other events that are kind of similar since then. And that format's kind of taken off and I haven't kept up with those, but I love that that kind of was, that's what CJI felt like to me. Yeah. A little bit. So, How about have yeah. P, uh, PGF? Have you have you looked at PGF at all? No. Brendan McCatherine, you know, 10th Planet guy? No? I okay. haven't, no. It's kind of like, uh, basically, I mean, they like kind of, I guess initially the first year he kind of like basically recorded like an entire season in a week and then just like put it out. So okay. like matches in a tournament system. So uh, it's a little, I, it's not something that I really like fo laser focus in and watch. We had him on the show once. We talked about it when he was first getting it off the ground. Um, uh, but that, that's something that's taken off. So they did, they did a season. I think they're like doing a season right now. Okay. Uh, but it's, uh, now I think they're kind of doing it more live. Like the last one they did was literally like live or at least the week before they had a few matches and then they did this live final event. So I interesting, different takes kind of like leagues kind of, you know, points. And if you get a submission, you get this many points towards your total versus if you got, you know, if you just got a decision, you made this, like you get this many points. So um, it's it's not just like I win, I beat everybody. It's kind of a point system as well. So kind of interesting, interesting. take, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's totally different than just the, the traditional tournament. Um, ultimate goal in jujitsu. What, what would you like to say? You know, what, what would you want your legacy to be? My legacy. This is, all, this is usually the thinker. If <laughs> you like legacy. <laughs> <laughs> you get, this is called jujitsu dummies, right? <laughs> Legacy. <laughs> I think. I think I, uh, I, I, I. Somebody asked me something kind of related to that question at one point, and I think what I said was I think they asked it about like 
in, in general, what do you want? What do you want to accomplish in your life? And what I said then, and I think what I, what I still feel probably more so even than when I said it, was that when I was young, I was very concerned about accomplishing something and sort of making something of my life. Um, and that I felt like I, I had to maybe hit these goals and hit these markers and hit these, create these products um, get this this belt and write this book and get you know get to this level of you know get an agent get a publisher get a this get a that um, and that if I did those things that my life would have been validated by some sort of external uh, governing body that gave me its stamp of approval, which I think is is you know often young younger people feel that way. And I, I think I said at the time, and I've definitely said to people since, that one of the, the gifts of getting older has been getting to let go of that to some extent and realizing that it, it's far more important to me now to be interested and energized by what I'm doing than to worry about what it's coming to. Mm -hmm. um, and so even though in the last five years I've probably, I, I've done things that are the most significant in terms of more people are aware of them and more people have engaged with them. Um, I, I, I don't want to say that that's less important to me, but it's sort of been in, in a similar way to maybe saying when we start letting go is when we start getting more because I, stopped worrying so much about hitting these markers and I started just letting, as you said, letting the business steer, letting the energy of the situation pull me forward rather than trying to push towards some object, objective. Um, it's, it, things have started to happen more and more and it's become more and more clear to me that the, the, the quality of the time is by and and the qual the highest quality of the time would be in spending it being energized being inspired being excited to get out of bed being being uh, pulled by my interest in whatever I'm doing is much more important to me than what anything I'm doing accomplishes maybe in the faith and in the belief and in the trust that in doing that these things will get accomplished that do have an impact and have a reach. Um, so uh, l legacy is something I think about less and less, honestly. I mean, I want to keep doing, I want to keep writing, I want to keep doing jujitsu, I want to keep working on interesting projects, I want to keep learning from people who are, who are giving me the kind of insight and the kind of, you know, the further into the rabbit holes that um, I want to go down. I want to keep doing those things up until the point that those activities stop doing that for me. And at that point, I want to have the, I would say, maybe courage to, to let go of those things and find the things that actually pull me. Um, so I don't know, that's a, maybe that's not a, a great way to answer that question, but that's kind of, when, when people talk about like legacy or what are you trying to accomplish? I mean, that, that's really, all, all I can, all I can can say now, I guess. Gotcha. No, that, that makes sense. The, that's okay. that's an answer. Okay. All right. Last question. Okay. And uh, I see those belts hanging over your shoulder back there. Oh yeah. We always ask this one. This is uh, we've we've had. Uh, I used to do this podcast with uh, like four other people. We used to do roundtables pre-COVID, and then COVID kind of changed our model, and then we stuck with the. Uh, usually the one-on-ones or uh, we do still have people come in we do round tables and uh, sometimes I have a co-host, but we always had this internal argument about do you, or, or are you supposed to, do you, for you, do you, or do you not wash your jujitsu belt? Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Oh no. You don't like the question or, Oh no, you don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. I don't like, I don't know about the questions because like, cause then people, you know, like, no, I've never washed a jujitsu belt in my You've life. You've never washed, never. No. Wow. That's a long time. <laughs> it's icky. It might be icky. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, well, no, I remember watching and probably you have seen it or some of your listeners have seen it, that video that came out 
in whatever it was, um, 2015, or I want to say, where Howder, Howder goes like, I want there to be a molecule of sweat from everybody I've rolled with in my belt. And I'd never thought about it like that, but that, that kind of resonated me, with me when he said it. I mean, I, it wasn't like I stopped washing my belt at that point. I hadn't been washing it all along. Um, but, I don't, you know, like maybe here's how I feel about it. I want the wear and tear on my belt to be genuine. And I feel like washing it kind of accelerates yeah. that. That has been the only answer that I've gotten from people that resonated with me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the mojo and the blood of my, you know, the foreign <laughs> right. warriors. And, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, that can't, but you know, I, I was a belt washer. I, 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 other than white belt, I had a, uh, from blue to brown. I always had two belts. Mm-hmm. Had them in my bag, wore one, throw it in with my gi at night, wash my gi every night, throw the belt in. I never thought about it. And I mentioned Wagner before. I, I interviewed Wagner and his wife. And, and Wagner, he was sitting right next to me in our old studio. And I never got a look of like, I never had anybody look at me like, are you fucking kidding me? You wash your belt. Like the way that he looked at me was just like, what are you, a fucking idiot? Of course you don't wash your belt. Like it was, and, but it, his thing was, um, that people who wash their belt are trying to make it look like they train more. So the, yeah. the wear and tear is not from the training. I said, you know what? I, I've always had two belts, never considered it. My schools were relatively small. My coach knows how much I train. It's not like I could get lost in some shuffle of hundreds of students. So like for me, I, I got the, I got the reason he didn't say the mojo and like, you know, the blood. And it was just like, you're, you're trying to make it look like to the outside world that you're, you're training more than yeah. you. I was like, okay. I could live with that. I can't live with the like, no, you know, samurai, you know, whatever. I don't know all the different bullshit that people try to pull out the mojo. And I've got a piece of your blood on my belt and it makes my jujitsu better. Or if yeah. you want, I do love the comedy around like somebody, <laughs> there's a guy that did, he put his black belt in the wash. He's like, yeah, I wash my black belt all the time. When he takes it out, it's a brown belt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, I get that. And it's funny and it's fun. But it, again, we've had a lot of fun with that. Uh, we usually throw something on. You might see on the screen if you watch the whole video back, it's gonna say, uh, a it's gonna say hashtag powers in the belt. So it's usually <laughs> okay. it's belt washers or it's uh, it's a hash uh, uh, powers in the belt. So you got the powers in the belt <laughs> yeah. since you don't All wash. Right. But right. Scott, listen, thank you so much for doing this. Let me give you a minute if you want to shout out your brand, give them the Instagram, anybody you want to say hello to, or you know, uh, I mentioned the book again. Uh, this is your time. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, so people can follow me on, on social media, uh, Facebook and Instagram at, at Enclave Jiu Jitsu, E N C L A V E Jiu Jitsu. Um, I'm also at www.enclavejujitsu.com. Um, you can keep up with my writing stuff at scottburrauthor.com or on Facebook at Scott Burr Author. Um, the, the, uh, the gi company I mentioned is blackmarketkimonos.com, uh, 10%. Through, through the end of the year, 10% of all sales are going to be getting donated to Richard's uh, GoFundMe as well. So if people do go there and they check it out and they, they like something, know that 10% of that sale is going to go to Richard's GoFundMe. And then, of course, Richard's book is uh, uh, worthdefendingbook.com or uh, on social media at worthdefendingbook if people don't know about uh, that book. Um, the, the it's you know uh, print ebook and audio book and um, there are links in the bios on that social media and on that website if you go to worthdefendingbook.com the first thing you're going to see is a little blurb about richard's health situation and a link to the gofundme mm -hmm. that gofundme link is in the bios of the social media so uh richard really needs our support right now and he really really appreciates this the support that he's got and i should also mention um i i, I emailed a, a bunch of schools across the country uh one of the ways that people are looking for a way to 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 do something for richard beyond just um donating to that gofundme one of the suggestions i i put out was um if you can if you want to host an open mat where uh the the entrance fee or the mat fee for that open mat 
is a donation to Richard's GoFundMe. I made up a graphic and it's on the social media or you can, you can email me through any of the, those links and I can send you this graphic, but it's talking about Richard and the situation and then it's got a QR code um, that, you know, if you, you print that out, you have that under your open mat, people walk in the door, they scan a QR code, they make a donation and that's their entry fee. And people have been hosting those, it's brought in, uh, it brought in some, some, some funds um, and that is so much appreciated, but if anybody's interested in, in hosting one of those, it's an easy way to have a little bit more impact um, for for that for for Richard and that GoFundMe. Um, so right now, that's 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 our focus is trying mm -hmm. to 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 bring uh, bring awareness and bring some. And for the money. listeners, we'll we'll keep on putting the um, the the GoFundMe link in our descriptions and so on Jujitsu really Dummies. It that. is if you click on our bio. You'll see, like, they show you one link, but if you click on that, it opens up a window that shows you, like, our other links. And Richard Bressler's GoFundMe is right in there as well. So if you click on the link in our bio, it will come up before it takes you to anything else. Um, Scott, stick around one second because we're going to take a couple of pictures with you on the screen here for promo and for the launch, okay? I'm just going to shout out a couple. Of, this is, like, going to take less than a minute. Unlock the power of your online presence with Black Belt Digital Marketing. Their reputation management program ensures your Google business profile seen by more potential customers. Black Belt Digital Marketing is your full-service digital marketing agency specializing in local SEO and reputation management. Boost your business today. Visit bbdigitalmarketing.com. Your success is their priority. Special thank you to the crew over at Flow & Roll for all their support. Flow & Roll is renowned for their incredible Nogi rash guards, shorts, and leggings. Flow & Roll has quickly become the premier custom apparel provider for academies big and small throughout the United States. Reach out today to discuss your custom order and ask about their incredible pre-order program. You can send an email to flowenroll at gmail.com or visit their Instagram at flow underscore n underscore roll and shoot them a direct message. And yes, they can create an awesome custom gi for your academy as well. Visit flowenroll.com to check out their awesome designs and remember, you'll get 20% off your purchase of T-shirts, rash guards, or geese with code JJD. Uh, shout out to BioPro, uh, BioProteinTech.com. Get $30 off with code JJD on their regularly priced kits. Um, uh, I, I take the stuff. I take the, the day and night uh, programs. You take a little vial, put it on your tongue. It's like an uh, like alternative to HGH. Uh, the BJJ box, they've been with us, uh, again for, for a little bit, for a couple of months now, check them out at the BJJ They went to quarterly boxes, right? You get a nice box with a nice, uh, you, know, you get a t-shirt, you get some, um, like different products. You might get some protein bars and some different things. It's like a little, uh, little box of goodies, uh, something new every month. Uh, that's, uh, the BJJ And again, it's 20% off your first box with code JJD 20. Uh, you can check us out at Jiu-Jitsu Dummies on Instagram, on YouTube. It's Jiu-Jitsu Dummies Podcast. Obviously, if you're listening uh, to the podcast sound, you could jump over and watch the full video. Uh, my personal IG is Uncle Milty BJJ. And that's it. Thank you for watching and listening, everybody. Peace, love, Jiu-Jitsu. Thank you, guys.